You know, I said to the 830 crowd, and I'll say again to you, there is some intentionality around a common theme today, and that's normally how we order services each Sunday, but it's just worth mentioning today that from the beginning of the service, when we started with Jesus is the sweetest name I know, to where we are right now and everything that has come in between, it's just so amazing that the object of our attention is Jesus. And so today I want to encourage somebody. Today I want to strengthen somebody. Today I want somebody to leave here better than you came because I need you to hear me when I tell you that Jesus is still the one. I like John the Baptist's story because it gives us an opportunity to examine ourselves and to see God working in and through us. Some of you may know the story. John the Baptist got locked in prison. He was actually in prison when he called his disciples and and sent them out to Jesus. Now, he got there because he dared to tell King Herod that Herod's marriage to his brother Philip's wife was not only ungodful, but it was unlawful. It says to me that John, even in his day, felt an obligation to not only address spiritual matters, but he also felt the need to address social matters. Ask you a question, I'm going to go on. It'll be a sermon for another day, but I want you to think about what if church folk began to take seriously their role in modeling both social and spiritual behaviors that honored God. Mm. John the Baptist in a tight spot. Looking back over his life and facing death begins to question, was it all worth it? Did I go too far? Did I give too much? And you got to know this is the same John who had experienced mountaintop experiences, George. I mean, this is the John who comes from the lineage of Elizabeth and Zechariah, first cousin to Jesus, forerunner. This is the same John who looked up and thousands upon thousands of people were coming to him to be baptized, getting ready for Jesus. The same John who looks up and, wow, oh, there comes Jesus himself, the Lamb of God, baptized by John. Same John who witnessed the heavens opened up. Now John was at what seemed like the bottom. Not what he had hoped for and certainly not what he had expected. He was sitting in a rat infested cold jail cell all alone. Can I just stop and say that where John was is not any place new? Can I just say to you that all of us no matter who we are when we're on this journey called faith and we're walking with God, we have some highs where we see God clearly blessing us and we see God clearly moving on our behalf. And then every now and then there are some lows that will come that will cause us to question why am I in this in the beginning? It's not uncommon, but I need you to hear me when I tell you that God wants you to know that no matter who you are and where you are, he has promised you that he never promised that you wouldn't go through. But he did promise you wouldn't go through it alone. Oh, somebody ought to be encouraged by that. Somebody ought to be encouraged by being reminded that Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. John thinking to himself, what, what is this all about? I, I did the right thing and, 
I did it for all the right reasons and it looked like life was going so good and it looked like folk were on board and all of a sudden I find myself locked up. Well, I, I got to tell you, in the midst of all of that, John just needed to remember his story. He had a story, my friends, and he needed to remember it. Can I just pause for a minute to say, Klein, in the midst of where you are right now, you have a story to remember. And in days when it looks like that all hell is broken loose and there's nothing you can do about it, in days when it looks like the folks that you thought were on your side are no longer not, and in days when it looked like what you thought was right is now wrong and what you thought was wrong is now all right, I don't need you to go down, but just remember that it's okay to be there. But no, you're not there alone. You just got to remember to go back to where this thing all started. I, I, I said to somebody earlier today, you know, that, that this faith journey has its ebbs and its lows. It has its highs and its lows. It has its goods and its bads and its real goods and its not so goods. You know, it's sort of like marriage. And, you know, every now and then, Debbie has to look at Stuart and just remember why she started in the beginning. Every now and then, Ashley's got to look at Stephen and say, oh, I remember when I first met him, that twinkle in his eye, you know, when he's cutting up and he ain't cooperating like, you know, wives want husbands to do. You know, every now and then, Carol has got to look at Mike and, and remember how this thing all got started. All I'm saying to you, friends, is that John the Baptist understood his story, and yet he was in a difficult place. And what does he do? He goes back to the beginning. He says, I'm going to call two of my trusted disciples, and I'm just going to go have them to go to Jesus. I'm locked up. I can't go myself, but I'm going to have them to go to Jesus. And Doug, the question is simply this. Are you the one? Are you the one that saves? Are you the one that heals? Are you the one that delivers? Are you the one who forgives and delivers? He calls two of his disciples and says, I need you to go and ask Jesus a very important question. And so they go and they say, John the Baptist sent us. And he just wants to know, are you he who is to come or shall we look for another? Now, I can imagine in Jesus' mind, he's standing there saying, wait a minute. Isn't this the same John that just a few days ago baptized me? And is he really at this place now? John has got to know that he knows. C can I just say to somebody this morning, you've got to know that you know, don't you understand that for every success in your life, the devil is angry, so he really wants to try to steal your joy, you know, but somebody got to declare today that God is too powerful, God is too good, God has done too much, and in spite of what the enemy may try to do, I am not going to allow the world to steal the O out of my joy, because this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Guess what? The world didn't give it, and the world can't. Oh, somebody going to talk to me. You got to remember that Jesus is the source. So Jesus, look at his response. And I've always thought this to be very interesting, Kerry, because he didn't say anything right away. No, go back and look at it. They come to him with this profound question. And what does he do? He gets busy healing blinded eyes. He gets busy healing lame legs. He gets busy curing folk of leprosy. Well, what's the point in this? Was he ignoring them? No. Was he insensitive to John's dilemma? Certainly not. Was he annoyed? No, 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 my friend. I, I am convinced that Jesus said if John the Baptist has come to a place where he is at this flow of a point in his life, not only must they go back with the word of what I said, but they need to have a story to tell that says he didn't just say it, but we saw him do it. Oh my God, how many times, how many times have you, like I, 
Being at a place where you're talking to God and you can't hear nothing. God, I, I, I did this because you started this thing. I, I'm at a, a tight spot. I can't hear nothing. God, God I, I, I got this way because you brought me here and now all of a sudden all hell is broken loose and I'm, I'm waiting on an answer, but I can't hear nothing. God, where are you? I can't hear you. God, I'm trying to talk to you. You won't answer. God, what, 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 what? Anybody ever been there where it just looked like God was ignoring your pain and ignoring what you were going through? No, I have. But can I tell you the rest of the story? In the midst of my struggling, in the midst of my moaning, in the midst of my lamentations, and I'm saying, God, where are you? You told me all these things, and I'm standing on your promise, and God, I need you to, I God, I need you to, God, I need you to, God doesn't say a thing, but all of a sudden, the fire that was about to consume me goes out. All of a sudden, the flood that was about to take me over, the water starts to recede. All of a sudden, the murmurings and the noise that just would not go away become silence. All of a sudden, with nothing being said, I begin to see that there is a way being made. There's a peacefulness that's happening. What are, what's going on? Let me tell you. It's when God is at his best because here's the good news. Even when he doesn't say a word, he can do and move and you'll know that he's on your side because he opens doors that no man can close. He closes doors that no man can open and he delivers not just one time, not just two times, but over and over and over again. Oh, somebody ought to be happy. So Jesus understood, my friend, that action speaks louder than words. And John the Baptist's disciples needed to go back with a story that John could believe. I'm just going to stop for a minute. Because somebody's not convinced. Somebody is saying, but preacher, you don't know what they said to me. Somebody is thinking, but preacher, you don't know how long I've been down this road. Somebody is saying, but preacher, you don't really understand how deep my pain is. And I'm saying, no, I don't. But I know somebody who does. Oh, I'm so glad that I started in ministry as opposed to law school. Because let me just tell you, I was having a lot of fun in law school. Man, and I can't tell you about what he went on on Thursday nights when class was over. I was in New Orleans, up on St. Charles. Anybody familiar with that area, you figure it out. <laughs> oh, my God. But I got into this thing called ministry, not because my grandmother thought it was a good idea, even though she did, when I was 15, she wanted to call me to preach. But no, 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 I knew that if I went because Granny wanted me to go, it was going to cause some problems down the road. I got into this thing not because my mother, who was the shero of my life and is watching me in heaven now, just smiling because she says, that boy really was listening to some of the stuff I said. I didn't do it because she was inclined for, to, for me to go that way. No, no, no. I woke up one day and heard a voice from heaven saying, Young, you are my beloved. I have called you to a work. I am going to give you what you need. I'm going to be with you for the balance of your days. Anything you need, I've got it. Any place you go, I'll be with you. And don't you worry about the enemy because no man is stronger than I am. And if I'm for you, I can destroy the whole world. And I said, oh, I, got, I like this dude. Oh, yeah, this is good for me. What I'm just trying to tell you, and I'm going to be done in a minute, but I'm just trying to tell you, you can't get through it worrying about what people say and what people think and what people believe. You got to remember who calls you. You got to remember who started it and trust it that the one who has started this will indeed see you through. Well, after he had done the healing, he looked at John's disciples and said, now you go tell John. Tell John what your eyes have seen. Tell John what your ears have heard. Tell John that I know where he's at. Tell John I've never taken my eyes off of him. You tell John he need not worry. 
I am the one that he was looking for, and I will get him through this no matter what he believes. He says, you tell John that I'm the same one that just a few days ago took a few barley loaves and a few fish, and I threw a picnic, and I fed 5,000 plus. You tell John that I'm the same one that not too many days ago I got called out by Mary and Martha. They were declaring, oh, if you had a been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You tell John, I'm the same one that looked at Mary and Martha and said, oh Mary, don't you weep. You tell Martha not to moan. Pharaoh's army has all drowned in the red. You tell John that I said that in just a few days from now, he's going to look up and he's going to see me hanging on a cross. Nails in my hands, nails in my feet, crown of thorns on my head. But tell John that he need not worry. Let him know that I am dying in order that he might live. Oh, somebody ought to get this. Jesus died in order that we might live. He says, but don't you worry. The rest of the story is this. Going down in a borrowed tomb gonna stay there Friday night, gonna stay there Saturday, gonna stay there Saturday night. But can somebody say early, can I get any witnesses, early Sunday morning, he's gonna get up, and when I get up, I'm gonna get up with an attitude and a declaration. Can't you see him? One foot in the gates of hell, the other foot in the steps of heaven declaring all power, all power is in my hand. Oh yeah, that's good news. You tell John, I know exactly where he is. I understand exactly what he's going through. And there is nothing that he is going through that I can't get him through. My friends, I want to encourage somebody today Wipe your tears. Pick your chin up. And remember that Jesus loves you. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. And so wherever you are and whatever you are experiencing, know that you are not alone and that the God who called you to it is the God that you can trust to see you through it. You may not always see him. He may not always show up on what you call on time. But he's never late. He's never late. Can I just close with a little story that maybe many of you have heard me tell or maybe you've heard others tell before? It's the story of a little boy who was out in the park one day and he was flying his kite. And the story says that the kite was so high in the sky until all you could see was a string. And so people would come by and see this little boy holding this string and they would say, little boy, what are you doing? And he'd answer them with a big grin, I'm flying my kite. People would walk by, Kelly, one after another, saying, little boy, what are you doing? And he says, I'm flying my kite. They'd look, all they see is a string, they let him go on. Somebody got bold enough to come by and say, little boy, what are you doing? He says, I'm flying my kite. They looked at him. They looked at the string. They looked up at the sky. They looked back at him. They looked at the string. Then they asked the magic question. How do you know that the kite is still up there. Oh, Doug, the little boy got a big old grin on his face. It's like, oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. And here's what he said. He says, I know you don't see it, but the reason I know it's still there, because every now and then, 
I get a tug on the other end that lets me know that the kite is still connected. What am I trying to say to somebody? This ain't no kite story. Don't get it confused. I'm trying to tell you that even when you can't see him, Jesus is present. Even when you don't know he's there, God is there. All you got to do is be still long enough to feel that tug. All you got to do is be still long enough to hear that whisper. All you got to do is be still and trust that God loves you enough to always be your comforter. And never will he leave you alone. Somebody need to hear it. Somebody needs to believe it. Somebody needs to receive it. Yeah. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, I need you to say this for yourself. Yes, Jesus loves me for my Bible. Say it with me one more time, but I'm going to be done. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, you need to hear it. Oh, yes, Jesus. I read it in his word. Yes, Jesus love. How do I know? For the Bible tells me so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.